Let me go ahead and pull up the slide that we pull up typically at the beginning of each one of these classes, which is our roadmap, if you will, to the book. Um, and if you'll look at that, we're in that area of the red box this evening where we have a discussion of the fall of Babylon, the harlot or the prostitute. We've been talking about that in chapter 17 and 18 tonight in chapter 19, the first 10 verses, we're going to finish that up. And then starting in verse 11 of chapter 19, we're going to talk about the complete and final victory of the church. That's going to carry us all the way then into chapter 22. The book of Revelation breaks down very nicely into two halves. There is the first half, chapters 1 through 11. They tell the story that God is conveying to his people from the earthly perspective. And then chapters 12 through 22 tell the same story again, but from the perspective of the deeper spiritual background. And so a lot of the things that we read in the second half of the book of Revelation sound an awful lot like things we've read in the first half of the book of Revelation. And if you've been noticing that, there's a good reason for you to notice that because indeed that's exactly the way it is. Both halves of the book of Revelation tell the same story. They just tell it from a different perspective. And so you get the story told twice. So that's where we are this evening. We have two classes left in Revelation. We have Sunday evening. Then we have one week from tonight on Wednesday night. And then one week from Sunday, we start our new uh, adult teaching quarter at North Beach. And there's going to be some classes on Zoom. I'll be teaching the book of Isaiah here on Facebook Live. And so if you've signed up for that class, if you're a member at North Beach, just keep coming right back here. This is where we're going to be. If you are with us visiting this evening, I know we have some visitors with us that are not members at North Beach. You'll be welcome to join us in that as well. That starts on the first Sunday in September, and it will be on the book of Isaiah. All right, having said all that, Let's go ahead and get into the chapter itself, Revelation chapter 19. Uh, not a whole lot of material to cover tonight, but uh, we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, all will send me some questions here in the comments that we can address in the class. Uh, don't be afraid to send those to me. Don't be afraid even to send the hard questions. The absolute worst that will happen is I'll say I don't know. In which case, I won't know, and I'll try to find an answer for you and come back to the next class with that. But don't be afraid to write comments. Don't be afraid to ask questions. All right, so Revelation chapter 19, as we start off the chapter, the first six verses, we get a series of four hallelujahs. Let's go ahead and read all six of those verses, and we're going to talk about them individually in just a moment. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. All right, we're going to stop right there in verse 6. I choose to divide this at verse 6 and not continue on in verse 7, simply because I want to bracket those four hallelujahs off. As we look at these, before we talk about them individually, let's talk about them generically. The word hallelujah surprisingly occurs only here in the New Testament. Now, that's a word that we see in the Old Testament, but you would think sometimes, given how people talk and given how some religious groups sound, you would think that hallelujah is a word that occurs repeatedly in the New Testament, but that would not be the case. It only occurs here in the New Testament these four times. That word literally means praise Yahweh or praise Jehovah or praise the Lord, if you will. And it is a word of praise. So sometimes, uh, sometimes in modern English, people take it upon themselves to say the word hallelujah, and they're not really praising God in doing that. It's just become kind of an interjection for them. I would caution Christians that they need to understand that this word hallelujah is a word of praise, and it mentions the name of God. So if we're using that word in a way that wouldn't be appropriate, if we're using that word just as an interjection, we probably ought to think twice about doing that and kind of get that word out of our vocabulary, except when we're actually trying 
to praise God. So that's what the word means. Again, not a common word in the New Testament. It occurs only here these four times, even though we see it more in the Old Testament. All right, so looking at that, there are four of them, okay? The first of those hallelujahs, the speakers we are told are a great multitude in heaven. If you will look in your Bibles, Back up to verse 1, John says, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out. And they're the ones that say hallelujah. And very specifically in this hallelujah, they are praising God for his judgment upon the great prostitute and for avenging the blood of his servants. Now, We look at that, we say, okay, well, this is what's going on after the judgment. That's correct, okay? We see in uh, chapter 17 and 18, this uh, prostitute on the scarlet beast is judged by God. That's in answer to the fifth seal way back at the beginning of the book of Revelation. Remember the souls under the altar who cried out, how long, God, before you avenge our blood? Very specifically here in this first hallelujah, we have an acknowledgement that God has done exactly that. Latter part of verse two has avenged on her, this prostitute, Babylon, the blood of his servants. So this great multitude in heaven are crying out and praising God for having exacted vengeance on Rome for what Rome had done to God's people. Let's continue on then and look at the second hallelujah. The second hallelujah, the speakers again are the same. It's the great multitude in heaven. And specifically, they are praising here because of the smoke from the prostitute that goes up forever and ever. If you will look down at verse three again, It says, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. We can reference two verses in regard to this in chapter 18. We studied this last class, but if you will look with me in chapter 18, look at verse 9 again. Chapter 18 of the book of Revelation, verse 9. And the kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. Look down at verse 18 in the same chapter. Chapter 18 and verse 18. And cried out, all the shipmasters, the seafarers, the ones that are being discussed here. They cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? So in verse, in chapter 19, we have this hallelujah because of the smoke from the prostitute that goes up forever and ever. And of course, in 18, we see that smoke coming up as God is judging Rome and her empire. All right, let's then go back to our chart. You can go back to Revelation 19 if you'd like to. Uh, Revelation chapter 19, let's look at the third hallelujah here in the set. The third hallelujah, in this case, the speakers are the 24 elders and the four living creatures. You may remember at the very beginning of this class, I indicated that what goes on in the throne scene, okay, in the very beginning chapters of the book of Revelation where we have that, that throne scene of God, What's going on in that throne scene is going to come back over and over and over in the book of Revelation. This is another one of those cases. We see the 24 elders. We see them earlier in the book of Revelation falling down and worshiping. In this case, what do they do again? They fall down along with the four living creatures, those that are around the throne of God. They fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne. And then they say, amen. Okay, amen. Hallelujah. So their praise is simply one of praise. They are praising God. They are praising God on the throne. That word amen there is a word that is, uh, that, that conveys agreement. So when we say amen at the end of our prayers, say somebody is at the, at the congregation and they're leading us in public prayer and they finish their prayer and we say amen at the end of that prayer, that means that we are agreeing with that prayer. We are lending our voice to that. Uh, I think literally it means so be it or something to that effect. But the idea here is amen, hallelujah, so be it, praise be to Jehovah or Yahweh or or the Lord. That's the third hallelujah. Let's look at our fourth hallelujah this evening. Uh, In this particular case, uh, the voice, uh, the hallelujah is coming from, let's see, I need to get this right. It is coming as a voice from the throne, okay? Um, 
Let me see if I can get that. It's verse five. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God. I'm sorry, this is not the fourth hallelujah. This is an extra interjection here. And from the throne came a voice saying, praise our God, all you who his servants, who you who fear him, small and great. So the voice from the throne states, all God's servants should praise him. And this statement is sandwiched in between the third hallelujah and the fourth hallelujah. Who does the voice belong to? Difficult to say. It's hard to picture that coming from God simply because of the way it's worded. So it could be from one of those creatures or it could from one of those four living creatures or it could be from an angel. The, spe the text does not specify. But the statement that's made is that all of God's servants should praise him. So we've just had the 24 elders and the four living creatures praise God and that amen, hallelujah. Now we have this voice saying, all you who servants, all you his servants, you who fear him small and great, praise our Lord. That then gets us to the fourth hallelujah this evening. Let's pull up the next slide. There we go. The fourth hallelujah, the speakers again are a great multitude or the great multitude, if you will. And this particular case in verse six, the hallelujah involves praise for the God who reigns, Praise because the marriage of the lamb to his bride has come. All right. So uh, specifically, if you read into verse seven, which we did not do on the hallelujah, because it gets us to that marriage supper, which is our next topic. Um, For the Lord, our God, the almighty reigns. Verse seven, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Okay. It was granted verse eight. Let's just go ahead and read that too. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saint saints. So, uh, the praise that happens in the fourth hallelujah is because the marriage of the lamb to his bride has come. And the bride here is described as being clothed in fine linen, which quote is the righteous deeds of the saints. Of course, the bride here is the church. Individual Christians collectively form the church. And so this bride is pictured here being clothed in fine linen. Linen probably isn't something that we wear a whole lot today, but in the ancient world, it was fairly common. It was a nice material. It wasn't the material you'd go out to work in the fields in. She's clothed in fine linen. This is her bridal gown, if you will. But that linen represents the righteous deeds of the saints. And of course, that stands in contrast in the book of Revelation with all the evil deeds, the wicked deeds of the prostitute, of the beast, of the sea beast, of the earth beast, all of these that have arrayed themselves, have aligned themselves against God and his church. Their works stand in contrast with the bride. So you've got this Think about the imagery for just a moment. You've just had this prostitute. She looks, she looks like a prostitute. She's dressed in the clothing of the clothing of a prostitute, and she's riding that beast, that scarlet beast. You compare that then to this beautiful bride that's clothed in this beautiful wedding dress. It is the same kind of contrast that we would see if we pictured in our mind, if we were to go down to certain areas of Fort Worth or Dallas, uh, where the, the prostitutes hang out, and we were to see how they're dressed on the streets. I mean, you see a woman that's dressed in that way, you know exactly what she is. Compare that then to the picture of the bride on her wedding day. It's a complete contrast, isn't it? Between the wickedness and the righteousness. So the bride is clothed in this fine linen, which represents or is formed by the righteous deeds of the saints. We should recognize, brothers and sisters, that as Christians, as members of God's church, as a part of the bride of Christ, the things that we do reflect on the church as a whole. Are we, are we doing things that helps the bride to be clothed in fine linen? Or are we doing things that throw mud on that wedding dress? So that is the fourth hallelujah. Then we get, then we get the marriage supper of the lamb. Now we already read seven and eight. Let's go ahead and read verses nine and 10 of Revelation 19. Revelation chapter 19 verses nine and 10. Pull up that reference for y'all. And the angel said to me, write this, 
Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the, prof is the spirit of prophecy. All right. So the probable image that's going on here in the text is the engagement supper versus the actual consummation of marriage. This is something that's a little bit difficult for us because our marriage customs are different. But among the Jews of the first century, there would be an engagement period, a betrothal period, which was counted as if it was marriage, but there wasn't any consummation of the marriage. So if we will remember, of course, one of those very famous couples, we have Mary and Joseph. Joseph and Mary are betrothed, which for all intents and purposes means they are married. And yet they have not finalized that marriage. They have not come together to live as husband and wife. And it's during that period that Mary is found to be pregnant. And so what does Joseph want to do? Joseph wants to put her away. Joseph wants to divorce her. That would be the correct thing to do under normal circumstances because they were technically married even though it had not been consummated. This is, again, something very common, uh, very un uncommon for us, unusual for us, because our marriage customs are very, very different. We don't tend to celebrate with any kind of a major ceremony and engagement. Uh, we celebrate the wedding itself. Um, but in this particular case, probably the image here is of that engagement because the marriage is still a little bit future, okay? So again, we're probably looking here at Jewish betrothal and wedding customs. The final consummation of the marriage is going to happen after the prostitute has been judged. So we're going to see that in a little while in the book of Revelation. And that consummation is going to take place in heaven. We read about that in Revelation chapter 21. Let's look at these two real quick. We're going to come back to them later uh, before we finish out the book. But let's just go ahead and look at them very, very briefly here. Uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now look at verse 9, okay, in the same chapter. Verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. All right, so looking at this, Revelation chapter 21, I would take that to be the consummation of the marriage when the saints are at home with God. What's going on here in chapter 19 is actually something a little earlier than that, but it still involves a marriage supper, okay? So that's what we see going on. And then right on the heels of this, John does something unusual. John attempts to worship the angel and the angel tells him, don't do that, okay? This is important. Go back to Revelation chapter 19 and look with me, if you would, at verse 10. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus, worship God. So in the book of Revelation, there are all these incredible beings and John is not to worship any of them. You don't worship the angel. You worship God only. And of course, that's important because what's going on in the first century is Christians are being told you have to worship the Roman Empire or the Roman Emperor. You have to offer incense to him in order to prove your loyalty as citizens of Rome. And Christians uh, who were remaining faithful were refusing to do that because they were not going to offer worship to a man or to an empire. So in the book of Revelation, we have a very strong contrast between beings and people who should not be worshiped and the being who should be God. All right, let's continue on then here in the book of Revelation. If you've got some questions, be sure to go ahead and text, uh, type those in and I'll see them. All right, let's look at verses 11 through 16 then. We have the rider on the white horse. We get another rider in the book of Revelation. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, 
and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right. Uh, earlier we saw a rider on the white horse. Uh, the, during those seals, the seven seals of the scroll very at the very beginning of the book of Revelation. We talked then about the fact that that was Jesus Christ. Uh, even though that involves a certain amount of speculation, we get to Revelation, Revelation chapter 9, the rider this time on the white horse. There's no question whatsoever that this is Jesus Christ. He is called here the Word of God. And of course, that reminds us of John chapter 1. Take your Bibles and go over there with me if you would. John chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and then we're going to drop down to verse 14. I know y'all are familiar with this. You can probably quote this word for word. John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we are introduced in this verse to something or somebody that was in the beginning, that was with God, and at the same time was God. And of course, then in verse 14, what do we read? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. So we know based on verse 14, exactly who verse one is talking about. Jesus is the incarnate word of God. He is the word of God become flesh. And so then back in the book of Revelation, when this white uh, rider on the white horse is called the word of God, that's in verse 13 of Revelation 19, that tells us exactly who this is. This is Jesus Christ. Even if we don't have the other descriptions, which we do, which also help us identify him, this alone would be enough for us to know that this is Jesus. But this Jesus that comes on the white horse, he is arrayed for battle and he is leading the armies of heaven. So this is a warrior now. We have seen Jesus pictured earlier in the book of Revelation as a warrior. We have seen Jesus pictured as the lamb that was slain and is now alive. Here we see Jesus pictured again as a warrior, as a general leading the armies of heaven. He is arrayed for battle and he is a fearsome sight indeed. He is leading the armies of heaven to strike down the nations and rule the nations with a rod of iron. He will also tread the winepress of God's fury and wrath. Now we look at all of those references and these are things that quite honestly a lot of people don't think about when they think about Jesus Christ. Now do they? They think about Jesus Christ uh, as he was on the earth or as he's typically pictured on the earth um, as just kind of meek and gentle all the time. Uh, I think People need to remember that he does go into the temple two times and drives out the animals and the people that are selling there. So it's not always just gentle. But here in the book of Revelation, Jesus is most definitely not pictured in a way that we're typically used to thinking of him. So this Jesus Christ is a warrior. This Jesus Christ is arrayed for battle. He's leading the armies of heaven. He's going to strike down the nations. He's going to rule over them with a rod of iron, and he's going to tread the winepress of God's fury and wrath. This is an avenging Jesus. This is a punishing Jesus. This is a judging Jesus on nations that have arrayed themselves against God, against Jesus, and against his people. Remember, I've said in the book of Revelation that if you mess with God's church, you are messing with God. And God is going to deal with that. And so that's what we see going on here. He is also described, it's very interesting, some things that are, that are here. If you will look again at verse 12, um, and again, some of this imagery is coming out of the first chapter of the book of Revelation, that sword coming out of Jesus's mouth. Um, but if you will look with me in verse 12, we've seen 
some characters in the book of Revelation up till now that have diadems or crowns on their horns or on their heads. Look how Jesus is described. He's not limited. On his head are many diadems. Jesus isn't just Lord or King of a couple of nations or a few nations. He's got many diadems on his head. And of course, the text tells us, if you'll look down with me at verse 16 again, the name that is written on his thigh and on his robe is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, the Roman emperor thought of himself as the King of Kings, all these client kings that were under his control. He thought he ruled everything. He thought he was the greatest the book of Revelation comes along and says, oh no, you're not. Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And it is Jesus who reigns. It is Jesus who rules. This is a powerful image of the Lord that we serve pictured here in the book of Revelation. It is, it is perfectly legitimate and perfectly biblical biblical to think of Jesus as the gentle one. I think of Jesus when he's with the Samaritan woman and the Samaritan uh, woman, um, Jesus, Jesus says, you know, the dogs, uh, you don't throw the food to the dogs, right? And Jesus, uh, the woman's reply is, but even the, even the dogs eat the crumbs. And I picture Jesus with a smile on his face when she says that, and he grants her her wish. I picture Jesus when he's dealing with the woman, um, when he's dealing with the woman that was taken in adultery um, and he, he just sits down and he bends down in the sand and he writes in the sand and, and everybody leaves and he tells the woman, I'm not going to condemn you, go and sin no more. That's a gentle Jesus. That's a Jesus who is dealing with people in a gentle way. Then we have the Jesus that goes into the temple and drives out the animals and the money changers. Then we see the Jesus in the book of Revelation that is avenging the blood of his saints on the prostitute, the harlot, and the beast, Rome and its empire who had persecuted them. And so we need to have a balanced view of Jesus. And that involves all parts of that picture. Okay, so we've got a question here in the comments um, from Mary. She says, verse 12, why does he have a name written that no one knows but himself? What does this mean? This is a different name than verse 16. All right, let's go back up to chapter uh, 19 and verse 12. Okay, um, he has a name written that no one knows but himself. And of course, then later we have the name that's revealed. Okay, uh, he's called the word of God. and He's also called the king of kings and Lord of lords. Mary, I'm gonna give you my take on this. Okay, um, the idea of naming and the idea of knowing a name carries the idea of a certain amount of ownership or control over. And so um, when Jesus, when God knows our name or when we have a name that no one knows, a new name, we saw that earlier in the, in the letters to the churches in here in Revelation, uh, that's an idea. It's an idea of identity and belonging or ownership, if you will. So my take on this would be that with Jesus having a name written that no one knows but, him, but himself, that is to indicate the other things that are being indicated. It goes right along with these other things that are being indicated, and that is that no one rules over Jesus. He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. No one has any power over him. And of course, we're speaking here about Jesus as deity, okay? Um, not Jesus as the man who came to the earth uh, because certainly he had to put his will under the will of the Father. But Jesus is deity. When you're deity, there's no one over you, okay? Sometimes we have this hierarchical view of God that we have the Father, he's at the top. Jesus Christ is underneath him and somewhere in there we put the Holy Spirit. Certainly when it comes to the incarnation, Jesus coming to the earth, we can understand to a certain extent that hierarchical, hier that hierarchical understanding. But when we understand Jesus as deity, that understanding of hierarchy needs to go out the window because Jesus as deity, there isn't anyone over him because God, there's no one over God. And so probably that's what's going on there with that name. That's about... Uh, that's the explanation. That's the answer I would give, Mary. I hope that I hope that uh, helps you out there. Uh, if not, just uh, make another comment there, and I'll try to address that as well. All right. So this rider on the white horse, we've seen his identity. We've seen what he's all about. 
He's bleeding these armies out. And so now there is going to be a great battle. Let's read verses 17 down through 21. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the word that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Okay, this is probably a pretty unpleasant picture uh, when we when we kind of read it and understand what's going on there. Um, but we have this great battle. We'll look at the aftermath in just a moment. Jesus is on his horse. He's arrayed for battle. He's got the armies of heaven with him. The beast and the false prophet uh, are there with the kings of the earth to do battle. They're captured and thrown into the lake of fire. And all of his followers, all of their followers, I guess I should say, are slain. And notice the language here. It's kings, it's captains, it's mighty men, it's even the horses and their riders, the flesh of all men, free and slave, small and great, are slain. All of those who align themselves against God's people have but one ultimate end, and it is total defeat. The beast and the false prophet, they're thrown into the lake of fire. We're going to see the lake of fire yet again in the book of Revelation. But all of those who have followed them, all of those who have been uh, worshiping them, they are slain as well. Let's look on here at this great battle because then we have this image that isn't particularly pleasant. I hope all of you all have already had your dinner. And that is the birds of the air are gorged with their flesh. This would be an image that would be very familiar to the people in the ancient world because when there was a battle and many people were killed, sometimes people would go and find their loved ones and take them away and bury them. But very often the dead bodies simply became food for the animals. And in this particular case, we can kind of picture this image of all the slain on the ground and now the birds are coming down and they are not just eating their flesh, they are gorged with their flesh. That's a supper. It's not a very nice supper. It's, it's uh, not the supper we would want to be invited to, at least not if we're the main course, right? Again, the great battle, we have a total and absolute defeat for the beast, for the false, for the false prophet, and for all of their followers. It isn't going to be a halfway battle. It isn't going to be a halfway victory. The victory of Christ and his people over the enemies of God is going to be absolute, complete, and total. Now remember, the book of Revelation is written to people who aren't seeing the ultimate victory. It's being written to people who are then and there in the midst of persecution. It's being written to saints who are suffering for the cause of Christ. It's being written to saints who have seen their friends and their loved ones die simply because they're Christians. It's being written to saints who have lost their jobs and lost their income, lost their property. Maybe they've been sent off into, uh, into exile like John had been simply for the cause of Christ. And so if you are in Ephesus or Pergamum or Laodicea or Philadelphia there when they, when, when they receive this letter from John and they read these things, it is to assure them that the ultimate victory is in Christ. Because in that moment, in that instant, in those times, there'd be a lot of Christians who would really need that assurance. Because from the looks of things on earth, it doesn't look like the church is winning. A parallel might be that when you look uh, to the history of World War II, when you look in 1939 and you look in 1940, it looks like Germany is invincible. They have conquered Poland. They've conquered Czechoslovakia. They've absorbed Austria. They've conquered France. They're busily trying to conquer Britain. It just looks like the Germans are 
absolutely victorious and there's no way they can be defeated. And then you see in 1942, they begin to lose in Russia. 1940, I guess 1943, uh, the U.S. and the Allies invade in Italy and they're losing in Italy. And then in 1944, they, the Allies invade in Normandy and they're losing there as well. And by the end of the war, uh, the German war machine doesn't even have enough oil and gas to keep their tanks running. And so it's just absolute total defeat. But in 1939 and 1940, it looked like they were invincible. So when John is writing these words to these saints, it looks like Rome is invincible. But God assures them that the king that they are following is going to come on that horse with the armies of heaven and the beast and the false prophet and all of their followers are going to be defeated and are going to simply become food for the birds. That's Revelation chapter 19. If you got any questions, this would be a really good time to write them in there. We're just about finished with our class, but let me pull up the next slide so that you can see what I need you to read for Sunday. For Sunday, I need you to read Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 15. We are going to talk about the thousand-year reign. That's another one of those things that, that we find in Revelation that people just do all sorts of things with. We're going to look at this in the context of Revelation and what that's all about. So Revelation chapter 20, read for me if you will, verses 1 through 15. 